You are listening to a sermon by Dr. Richard Caldwell produced by Walking in Grace. Walking in Grace is a listener-supported ministry. Visit walkingingrace.org media to learn how you can help these messages reach more people. Good evening. It's good to see you. If you would please join with me in turning to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Tonight we've come to the 16th verse. We will read to the 19th verse. Matthew chapter 11 verse 16. Our Lord says, but to what shall I compare this generation. It is like children sitting in the marketplaces who call out to the other children and say, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our time in His Word tonight. Our Father in heaven, you have given us a great day. We thank you already for this day, this Lord's Day, where we have had opportunity to worship you together, and it's a joy to be back together tonight. Lord, I know that there are always many needs represented in this congregation, each and every worship service, particular needs, special needs, many needs that are unknown, unspoken, and I am so grateful to know that you are sufficient And the ministry of your word is sufficient for all of those needs. What we all need, Lord, all of the time, but especially in these days, what we need is nothing short of what God alone supplies. Human ability, human weaponry, human resources will fail, but what you supply, Lord, is enough, and it is It is not only enough, it is sweet to our souls as we experience your work in our lives. So Lord, we ask you to bless even tonight as your word goes forth. May this be a time that contributes to the ongoing work you're doing in each one of your children. Thank you that you've not only taken hold of us, you will never let go of us, and what you've begun you will will finish. Meet us tonight, Lord, around your word, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. It is not long after the Lord saves a person that we meet with a new and profound kind of sadness. No doubt with conversion there is great joy. The burden of sin has been lifted off of us. There is that liberty and freedom that we know in the Lord Jesus Christ But we're also introduced to new sorrows. And one of the great sadnesses that we know, one of the great sorrows that we know is the realization that we can give someone the truth and then not receive it. We can can speak the truth in love. We can share the truth with a great burden and a great zeal and have this person that we care about walk away unaffected. We can say it, but unless they have ears to hear, they won't hear it. We can show them in the Bible, but if they don't have eyes to see, they can't see it. And so there is this sadness of speaking the truth and demonstrating the truth from Scripture and yet having having someone we love very much be unaffected by it. 
This is not just true with relationships at a distance from us. This is true even in family situations. Someone you know well, in some cases, if you're a parent with a child, someone you've raised, someone that you've spent your entire life with, they, you, you know them, they know you, and you've communicated about all sorts of things over a lifetime, but they will not hear you when you speak to them of salvation in Christ. They will not hear you when you talk to them about even particular sins that are destroying them. What multiplies that sorrow is when not only do they reject the message, in a desire to escape the truth, they mischaracterize who you are. They don't just reject the message, they reject the messenger. They attack you, they slander you, sometimes taking even, even something that's legitimate about you, but exaggerating it to the point that it becomes a lie, all in an attempt to escape the truth. They have to find fault with the messenger to save their own reputation, at least in their mind. You know, I'm not an unteachable person. I'm not an unthoughtful person. I'm not someone who can't discuss these things. In an attempt to rescue their own reputation, they're willing to destroy yours. This, this is just a part of the kind of violence that the kingdom of heaven meets with. Our Lord has just described the fact that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence in the 12th verse. And now when you come to verses 16 through 19, you see an illustration of it, an illustration of that violence, an illustration of the rejection that's in view in this entire section. And so tonight, that's what I want us to consider. I want us to consider our Lord's explanation for a foolish generation, for the people who will not listen, how he explains a generation that rejects the kingdom of heaven. Four explanations for that generation, for that kind of people. I'll just mention each one as we come to it. The first one we see is this, the seriousness of hearing truth. And for this, I want to reach back to verse 15. How do you explain a foolish generation? How do you explain a person, an individual who rejects truth? Well, the first thing that you can know about them is they don't understand the gravity of meeting with the truth. Jesus in verse 15, after describing who John is and what his coming means, therefore who Jesus is, the kingdom that's being offered, the violence it's meeting with. He says in verse 15, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's an imperative. I like the New English translation which reads, the one who has ears had better listen. Our Lord gives a command to listen. Just a quick search, you know, if you use an electronic search mechanism and you use your computer and you search just on the word hear in your Bible, you'll, you'll be amazed by how much emphasis our God has placed on the seriousness of listening to the word. You cannot come face to face with the truth of God's word and not make a decision. The Bible always calls for a response. The Bible, in fact, always results in a response. It demands a response. You will either give it the response that it calls for, or whatever falls short of that will be your response. It's a response of its own, whether you want to admit it or not. You, you might want to imagine that you're giving no response or that you're simply indifferent to what you're hearing, but that is, in fact, a disobedient response. To do nothing with the Word of God is a disobedient response. So that what our Lord says in verse 15 is more than an exhortation. It's not, hey, I would just, you know, I'd really like for you guys to listen up. No, it's more than that. It's, it's a warning. You had better listen. 
Anybody who has the capacity to hear this, you better listen. I think a similar idea is found in Luke 8, 18, when our Lord said, Take care then how you hear. For to the one who has, who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. Do you understand there's a diminishing effect when you refuse truth? The Lord brings you the truth. You hear the truth. You refuse it. You reject it. Do you understand you, you, what happens over time is even what you think you have is taken away from you? It is a dangerous thing to willfully turn a deaf ear to the truth of God's Word. The book of Proverbs issues this warning, Proverbs 29, verse 1, He who is often reproved yet stiffens his neck will suddenly be broken beyond healing. It describes the kind of person who's warned and warned and warned and warned until finally the day comes when there is no more warning and there is instead a breaking. And the result of the breaking is there's no recovering what was lost. So the first thing you can recognize about the kind of generation that Jesus is about to illustrate is that it is hearing truth, but it's not hearing truth. Hearing John the Baptist, but not hearing him. Hearing Jesus, but not hearing him. And so it is with everyone who ultimately rejects the truth. They, they, it's not that they've never met with it, it's that they don't listen to it. Do you have ears to hear? Do you understand the seriousness of meeting with the truth of God's revelation so that you understand the gravity of listening up and taking His words into your life in a submissive, willing, obedient fashion? The seriousness of hearing the truth. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But then our Lord gives an illustration in verses 16 and 17. This is the second point, the stubbornness of those who will not hear the truth. The first thing that characterizes such a people, they, they don't take the truth seriously. There's no sense of reverence, gravity regarding what they're hearing. The second thing that characterizes them is there is a, a positively stubborn attitude toward what they're hearing. It's not serious, and what I do meet with, I prove to be stubborn about it. Our Lord gives a proverbial introduction, the kind of introdu introduction that announces a matter of wisdom when He says in verse 16, but to what shall I compare this, <coughs> this generation? To what shall I compare this generation? And if I were to paraphrase that, it would be something like this, how can I illustrate the danger and the foolishness of what I'm witnessing in the people who are resisting the kingdom? How can I illustrate the danger and the foolishness of these people who are violently attacking the kingdom? Our Lord tells a story. He says, but to what shall I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces, who call out to the other children and say, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. Jesus takes us to the marketplace, the agora, the, the central gathering place in a town in a city where goods were sold or traded and sometimes where people just met up to visit. Jesus, in this illustration, takes us to the marketplace. He, is, he has seen it many times. And in that marketplace, then He takes us to the young ones in the marketplace, the children. The parents are engaged in business. They're visiting with one another. But the children take it as an opportunity to meet with their friends and to play. We know about this even at church. We, we come for worship. Our children come with us. Watch what happens after the worship service. Watch how the children get with one another, how they talk, how they rejoice, how in some instances they go outside and they begin to play. Well, Jesus has seen this in the marketplace. 
And he takes us to their favorite games. As children are prone to do, they imitate adults. We've all seen it, children playing house, dressing up like mom or dad, dressing up as if they're going to work. Or if you're raised in a pastor's home, you pretend to preach. (laughs) Or you lead in singing, or you baptize. All of my children have been baptized hundreds of times. (laughs) in swimming pools. And I hate to say, but it didn't matter whether they were male or female, they were preaching. So (laughs) they didn't pay much attention to Scripture as they acted it out. Well, these children in the marketplace are playing funeral and they're playing wedding. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. Wedding and funeral. You play the flute, and you expect the other children to dance about as you play the flute. You play the dirge, pretend to play the dirge, and every one of the other children is supposed to pretend to be mourners. But as children are prone to do, there's someone in the group who is stubborn. They are uncooperative. They don't want to play, at least not according to the rules. If you say wedding, they say funeral. If you say funeral, they say wedding. I'm playing the flute. Why don't you dance? I'm playing the dirge. Why don't you mourn? The real issue is not the game. The real issue is selfishness. The real issue is sinfulness. Children are born with a sinful nature. That's why they need salvation. That's why we are good evangelists as parents. We pray for their souls, pray for their salvation. They are selfish creatures just like we all were before Jesus saved us. Self-centered, sinful. And so it's not uncommon to watch a group of children playing together and that sinfulness comes out and that stubbornness comes out. The other night, I think we had six of our grandchildren staying the night and the night began with with a movie. It's going to be a movie night. I naively thought that would be easy. (laughs) So we put on the movie app and and there's this whole list of movies in front of them. And I am not kidding you. I think it was 20 minutes. How about this one? No. How about this one? Yes. No. And it went on and on and on. No way to please the whole group. And so that, that stubbornness Jesus illustrates in a very simple, straightforward way with what he has seen in the marketplace, what we've all seen in the marketplace, as it were. Which brings us to the third thing we see in the text, and that is a specific application of the illustration having to do with slander. Verse 18, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. The specific slander of those who are rejecting the kingdom, claiming that their problem had to do with the messengers when in reality their problem had to do with the message wasn't how the message was coming to them. It was the message. John came in funeral mode. Here's one who lived an ascetic life. He emerged emerged from the wilderness, a bare kind of existence, the way that he ate, the way that he dressed. John was not sitting down to dinner with everyone. He wasn't attending weddings. Mark chapter 1, verse 4, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him 
and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. This is a man, a lifetime Nazarite. And what did they say about him? There's seriously something wrong with this man. He must be demon-possessed. Look at how he behaves. Listen to, to, the, to the tone of his message. He has a demon. Jesus came in wedding mode. Lived the life, apart, apart from sin, lived the life of a normal Jewish man. Even during the time of his public ministry, we see our Lord attending a wedding. First miracle he performs is at a wedding in Cana. We see him socializing with people. I think about Matthew after his conversion. We've seen it in our study of Matthew. He invites all of his friends from his old life into his home, and Jesus attends the guest of honor there for the purpose of reaching Matthew's friends. He does the same thing with Zacchaeus. You see him sitting down to dinners even with Pharisees in the gospel accounts. Or you would see Jesus and his disciples not paying attention to some of the traditional worship practices, not, not, not violating the law, just violating their traditions, but the traditions were ascetic in nature, had to do with what you refuse, and Jesus and his disciples were not characterized by that. Matthew 9, 14, then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? I mean, he uses a wedding illustration. Right now is a time for joy, Jesus is saying. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and they will fast. So here is John, someone who would have satisfied the people who wanted mourning. Here is Jesus, someone who would have satisfied the people who wanted dancing. And yet, what did they say about John? He has a demon. What did they say about Jesus? The perfect Son of God. What did they say about him? Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard a friend of tax collectors and sinners, and they did not mean that in a positive way. We are grateful he's the friend of sinners. But they meant by that he is a sinner himself. He is a compromiser. By the way, this ought to be a good lesson for all of us. Do never think that if you just live a winsome enough life, the world will speak well of you. The perfect son of God was slandered. What they said about John was not true. It was slander. What they said about Jesus was not true. It was slander. They took John's lifestyle of self-refusal and they exaggerated it. They took Christ's lifestyle that was normal by comparison and they exaggerated it. And the point that Jesus is making is if you don't want to hear the truth, you cannot be pleased no matter how the truth comes to you. You see, mom and dad, the reason I can't hear you is because of my history with you. Well, what about this person? You've never had any trouble with them. Why don't you listen to the same message from them? Well, there, you see, there's something else wrong with them and something else wrong with the next person and with the next person and with the next person. As if the problem is the messenger, but the problem is not the messenger. It's the message. They don't have ears to hear. They don't have eyes to see. Therefore, they have no appetite for the truth and the way they seek to avoid it is by tearing down the messengers. James Montgomery Boyce had this to say. He said, it is no different today, of course. God has many messengers with many varying gifts. Some are powerful speakers who can move a crowd to tears. 
Others are intellectual. They make a careful case for Christianity and present many powerful proofs of the gospel. Some teachers are outgoing, talkative, people-oriented. Others are retiring and thoughtful. Some write books. Others lead movements. Still others speak on radio or appear on television. Some are old and teach with the wisdom of their years. Some are young and proclaim the truth with youthful vigor. Some are prophetic. Some are analytic. Some, none of this matters to a generation of determined sinners who say in opposition, this one is too loud, that one is too quiet, this one is too intellectual, that one is too superficial. Close quote. In another place he says, so, that, so it is that we play the flute for those of our time and they will not dance. We sing a dirge and they will not mourn. What is to happen to such people? They will perish at the judgment as Jesus explains. What characterizes a generation that rejects the kingdom? What characterizes the generation that will perish in its sins? It is not serious about the truth. It doesn't understand the gravity of meeting with the truth. And it is stubborn when it meets with the truth. It is self-centered, self-driven. It has to have it its way. And then it slanders the truth in, a, in, in the desire to avoid it. It finds fault with every way the message comes to it and refuses as a result to hear the message. Which leads to the fourth thing we see in verse 19. <clears throat> Yet, Jesus says, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Vindicated, justified, proven righteous by her deeds. Wis I can say it this way. Wisdom is proven to be wisdom in the end. Wisdom is proven to be wisdom in the end. Wisdom operates in righteousness. The fruit of righteousness follows wisdom. And that is the best answer to wisdom's critics. John can be criticized, but in the end, John will be proven wise. Jesus can be criticized, but in the end, the whole world is going to see that he is Lord. Wait until the end, and what? And this is actually a very restrained response by Jesus. Wait until the end, and you will see what wisdom is. You reject the truth. You're stubborn in the face of it. You're not serious about it. You, you slander the messengers, but wait until the end, and wisdom will be vindicated. As we've heard before, time and truth walk together. Time and truth walk together. So as we take the truth of God, that He has graciously opened our eyes and our hearts to, brought us into the truth, made us to love the truth, saved our souls has given us a delight in it, but also a zeal about it so that we want to share the truth with everyone whom we have opportunity, but especially with those in our own families, in our longtime friendships, people that we care about very, very much. When we meet with that sad, profoundly sad experience of no desire, well, we can talk about anything in the world, but not God's Word. When you meet with that, remember what's at the root of it. It's not you, even when they want to make it about you. It's not you. I'm not saying, hear me carefully, I'm not saying that we can't hear criticisms and benefit from it. I'm not saying that we have been the perfect messengers. I'm not saying that we haven't at times through our own failures, been stumbling blocks to other people. But I'm saying that at the very root of it, when you talk about someone who doesn't believe, it's not really about the messengers. It's about the message. Can you remember that? And be encouraged about it and pray for them. Because you see, when you realize that, 
then you'll understand what you're engaged in is not a battle of personalities. It is not, what can I do to change your perception of me? It is, unless the Lord opens your heart, I could come in wedding mode and you're not going to like it. Or I could come in funeral mode and you're not going to like it. Unless the Lord changes your heart and opens your eyes, you will remain in this spiritual condition. Pray for them. Love them. The the Lord may indeed use your love and your witness, but ultimately it's going to be that He opens their heart. That's what is going to change the situation. So let me finish by looking at you from these two different vantage points. First of all, I would ask, what kind of listener are you? What kind of listener are you? I never know who has walked into a service like this. Maybe, maybe someone is here tonight, almost here against your will. Someone has sort of dragged you in because they love you. I, I wonder, what kind of listener have you been? Do you understand the seriousness of meeting with the truth of God's Word? Are, are you listening soberly? Are you listening, understanding eternity is before us when we meet with truth? Do you have ears to hear? And then then I want to say even to those of us who are born again, the Lord has saved us. If you have ears to hear, are you hearing? Are you listening? We recognize this. Isn't it possible for us if we're not careful, to slip into a mode where we're not good sermon listeners. Because we are paying more attention to style, personality, instead of substance. What am I doing with the truth? Well, the man stumbled all over himself tonight. Yeah, yeah, but what was he preaching? What will you do with what he preached? Are you listening? But then I want to have you think about you as the truth conveyor, the one who is called by God to give the truth. And especially with those who are breaking your heart because they're not listening. Will you rest in the Lord? Will you understand the need for His power? Will you rely on Him? Will you have endurance? Will you have endurance when you are slandered? Will you have endurance when when something about you that might have an element of truth to it, it is exaggerated to the point you are mischaracterized? When the hearers try to avoid the message by destroying the messenger... Can you look to the end? Can you rest in the knowledge that wisdom will be vindicated? And yet do it in a way that you weep over the rejectors of truth. This is what we see in Jesus. Yes, he warned. Yes, he spoke of the judgment of the fire of hell. But he also wept. Matthew 23, 37, as Jesus approaches the very city that has mocked him and will reject him and crucify him, he says in the 37th verse, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. You see, this is not a short-term thing that characterizes the nation of Israel. This is a long-term problem of not hearing the Word of God, being stubborn in the face of it, slandering the messengers of it, in fact, murdering the messengers of it. You're the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. And then Jesus says, How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And you were not willing. Jesus, longing for the salvation of a people who were not willing, willing to gather a people and protect a people 
who were not willing. That's the sadness that sometimes belongs to the Christian life. And so tonight I want to encourage you, my brothers and sisters, when you meet with that profound, unique sadness that belongs to the Christian life, rest in the knowledge that your Lord has already, ex already explained it and described it. And rest in the knowledge of what the real issue is. It's not you, it's the message. And pray for the one who's rejecting because the only hope for them was the same hope for you. If the Lord had not opened our eyes, we would have all perished. We would have all remained stubborn in our sin, indifferent to what we were hearing. But the Lord had mercy on us. And the same God is able to save anyone in your life right now who is proving to be stubborn. Their stubbornness can be turned to softness in a moment. If Almighty God softens their heart, pray for them and endure. And the Lord's people would say, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the way that you encourage us. So often our ministry to others is discouraging. We see wondrous things, joyful things, lives transformed. But then there is that one person or the other that we would die to see them converted. And yet they will not. And what makes it even more painful is often that person whom we would die to see converted makes us the issue. And claims that it's not really the message, it's the messenger. Thank you, Lord, for the encouraging knowledge of what is really at work in a generation that can't be pleased. It is unbelief. It is hardness of heart. And so on behalf of all my brothers and sisters who, who have someone like that in their life tonight, Lord, would you soften those hearts? In fact, Lord, would you transform those hearts? Would you grant a heart of flesh where now we meet with a heart of stone? Would you break in a way that doesn't represent destruction, but in a way that represents salvation? And until then, would you grant endurance to my brothers and sisters as they pray and as they share your word and as they seek to live a life that testifies to the reality of the things they preach? Lord, would you grant them endurance and comfort their hearts and let them know that peace that passes understanding even as their heart breaks over the lostness of a loved one. We ask for these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior and King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together.